Life is complex. Join us for the simple gifts of wisdom, love, and delight in the written word. The Everlasting Man by G.K. Chesterton Part 2 On the Man Called Christ Chapter 5 The Escape from Paganism The modern missionary, with his palm-leaf hat and his umbrella, has become rather a figure of fun. He is chaffed among men of the world for the ease with which he can be eaten by cannibals. And the narrow bigotry which makes him regard the cannibal culture as lower than his own. Perhaps the best part of the joke is that the men of the world do not see that the joke is against themselves. It is rather ridiculous to ask a man just about to be boiled in a pot and eaten at a purely religious feast why he does not regard all religions as equally friendly and fraternal. But there is a more subtle criticism uttered against the more old-fashioned missionary, to the effect that he generalizes too broadly about the heathen and pays too little attention to the difference between Mahomet and Mumbo-Jumbo. There was, probably, truth in this complaint, especially in the past, but it is my main contention here that the exaggeration is all the other way at present. It is the temptation of the professors to treat mythologies too much as theologies, as things thoroughly thought out and seriously held. It is the temptation of the intellectuals to take much too seriously the fine shades of various schools in the rather irresponsible metaphysics of Asia. Above all, it is their temptation to miss the real truth implied in the idea of Aquinas contra Gentiles, or Athanasius contra Mundum. If the missionary says, in fact, that he is exceptional in being a Christian, and that the rest of the races and religions can be collectively classified as heathen, he is perfectly right. He may say it in quite the wrong spirit, in which case he is spiritually wrong. But in the cold light of philosophy and history, he is intellectually right. He may not be right-minded, but he is right. He may not even have a right to be right, but he is right. The outer world to which he brings his creed really is something subject to certain generalizations covering all its varieties, and is not merely a variety of similar creeds. Perhaps it is, in any case, too much of a temptation to pride or hypocrisy to call it heathenry. Perhaps it would be better simply to call it humanity. But there are certain broad characteristics of what we call humanity while it remains in what we call heathenry. They are not necessarily bad characteristics. Some of them are worthy of the respect of Christendom. Some of them have been absorbed and transfigured in the substance of Christendom. But they existed before Christendom, and they still exist outside Christendom, as certainly as the sea existed before a boat, and all round a boat. And they have as strong and as universal and as unmistakable a savor as the sea. For instance, all real scholars who have studied the Greek and Roman culture say one thing about it. They agree that in the ancient world, religion was one thing, and philosophy quite another. There was very little effort to rationalize and, at the same time, to realize a real belief in the gods. There was very little pretense of any such real belief among the philosophers. But neither had the passion, or perhaps the power, to persecute the other save in particular and peculiar cases. And neither the philosopher in his school, nor the priest in his temple, seems ever to have seriously contemplated his own concept as covering the world. A priest, sacrificing to Artemis in Caledon, did not seem to think that people would someday sacrifice to her instead of to Isis beyond the sea. A sage following the vegetarian rule of the Neopythagoreans 
did not seem to think it would universally prevail and exclude the methods of Epictetus or Epicurus. We may call this liberality, if we like. I am not dealing with an argument, but describing an atmosphere. All this, I say, is admitted by all scholars. But what neither the learned nor the unlearned have fully realized, perhaps, is that this description is really an exact description of all non-Christian civilization today, and especially of the great civilizations of the East. Eastern paganism really is much more all of a piece, just as ancient paganism was much more all of a piece than the modern critics admit. It is a many-colored Persian carpet, as the others was a varied and tessellated Roman pavement. But the one real crack right across that pavement came from the earthquake of the crucifixion. The modern European, seeking his religion in Asia, is reading his religion into Asia. Religion there is something different. It is both more and less. He is like a man mapping out the sea as land, marking waves as mountains, not understanding the nature of its peculiar permanence. It is perfectly true that Asia has its own dignity and poetry and high civilization, but it is not in the least true that Asia has its own definite dominions of moral government, where all loyalty is conceived in terms of morality. As when we say that Ireland is Catholic, or that New England was Puritan. The map is not marked out in religions, in our sense of churches. The state of mind is far more subtle, more relative, more secretive, more varied and changing, like the colors of the snake. The Moslem is the nearest approach to a militant Christian, and that is precisely because he is a much nearer approach to an envoy from Western civilization. The Moslem in the heart of Asia almost stands for the soul of Europe, and as he stands between them and Europe in the matter of space, so he stands between them and Christianity in the matter of time. In that sense, the Moslems in Asia are merely like the Nestorians in Asia. Islam, historically speaking, is the greatest of the Eastern heresies. It owed something to the quite isolated and unique individuality of Israel. But it owed more to Byzantium and the theological enthusiasm of Christendom. It owed something even to the Crusades. It owed nothing whatever to Asia. It owed nothing to the atmosphere of the ancient and traditional world of Asia, with its immemorial etiquette and its bottomless or bewildering philosophies. All that ancient and actual Asia felt the entrance of Islam as something foreign and western and warlike, piercing it like a spear. Even where we might trace in dotted lines the domains of Asiatic religions, we should probably be reading into them something dogmatic and ethical belonging to our own religion. It is as if a European, ignorant of the American atmosphere, were to suppose that each state was a separate sovereign state as patriotic as France or Poland, or that when a Yankee referred fondly to his hometown, he meant he had no other nation, like a citizen of ancient Athens or Rome. As he would be reading a particular sort of loyalty into America, so we are reading a particular sort of loyalty into Asia. There are loyalties of other kinds, but not what men on the West mean by being a believer, by trying to be a Christian, by being a good Protestant or a practicing Catholic. In the intellectual world, it means something far more vague and varied by doubts and speculations. In the moral world, it means something far more loose and drifting. A professor of Persian at one of our great universities, so passionate a partisan of the East, as practically to profess a contempt for the West, said to a friend of mine, You will never understand Oriental religions. 
because you always conceive religion as connected with ethics. This kind has really nothing to do with ethics. We have, most of us, known some masters of the higher wisdom, some pilgrims upon the path to power, some Eastern esoteric saints and seers who had really nothing to do with ethics, something different. Something detached and irresponsible tinges the moral atmosphere of Asia and touches even that of Islam. It was very realistically caught in the atmosphere of Hassan, and a very horrible atmosphere, too. It is even more vivid in such glimpses as we get of the genuine and ancient cults of Asia. Deeper than the depths of metaphysics far down in the abysses of mystical meditations, under all that solemn universe of spiritual things, is a secret, an intangible and a terrible levity. It does not really very much matter what one does, either because they do not believe in a devil, or because they do believe in a destiny, or because experience here is everything and eternal life something totally different. But for some reason, they are totally different. I have read somewhere that there were three great friends famous in medieval Persia for their unity of mind. One became the responsible and respected vizier of the great king. The second was the poet Omar, pessimist and epicurean, drinking wine in mockery of Muhammad. The third was the old man of the mountain, who maddened his people with hashish, that they might murder other people with daggers. It does not really much matter what one does. The sultan in Hassan would have understood all those three men. Indeed, he was all those three men. But this sort of universalist cannot have what we call a character. It is what we call a chaos. He cannot choose. He cannot fight. He cannot repent. He cannot hope. He is not, in the same sense, creating something, for creation means rejection. He is not, in our religious phase, making his soul. For our doctrine of salvation does really mean a labor like that of a man trying to make a statue beautiful, a victory with wings. For that there must be a final choice, for a man cannot make statues without rejecting stone. And there really is this ultimate unmorality behind the metaphysics of Asia. And the reason is that there has been nothing through all those unthinkable ages to bring the human mind sharply to the point, to tell it that the time has come to choose. The mind has lived too much in eternity. The soul has been too immortal, in the special sense that it ignores the idea of mortal sin. It has had too much of eternity in the sense that it has not had enough of the hour of death and the day of judgment. It is not crucial enough, in the literal sense that it has not had enough of the cross. That is what we mean when we say that Asia is very old. But strictly speaking, Europe is quite as old as Asia. Indeed, in a sense, any place is as old as any other place. What we mean is that Europe has not merely gone on growing older. It has been born again. Asia is all humanity, as it has worked out its human doom. Asia, in its vast territory, in its varied populations, in its heights of past achievement and its depths of dark speculation, is itself a world, and represents something of what we mean when we speak of the world. It is a cosmos rather than a continent. It is the world as man has made it, and contains many of the most wonderful things that man has made. Therefore, Asia stands as the one representative of paganism and the one rival to Christendom. 
But everywhere else, where we get glimpses of that moral destiny, they suggest stages in the same story. Where Asia trails away into the southern archipelagos of the savages, or where a darkness full of nameless shapes dwells in the heart of Africa, or where the last survivors of lost races linger in the cold volcano of prehistoric America, it is all the same story. Sometimes, perhaps, later chapters of the same story. It is men entangled in the forest of their own mythology. It is men drowned in the sea of their own metaphysics. Polytheists have grown weary of the wildest of fictions. Monotheists have grown weary of the most wonderful of truths. Diabolists here and there have such a hatred of heaven and earth that they have tried to take refuge in hell. It is the fall of man. And it is exactly that fall that was being felt by our own fathers at the first moment of the Roman decline. We also were going down that wide road, down that easy slope, following the magnificent procession of the high civilizations of the world. If the Church had not entered the world then, it seems probable that Europe would be now very much what Asia is now. Something may be allowed for a real difference of race and environment, visible in the ancient as in the modern world. But after all, we talk about the changeless East very largely because it has not suffered the great change. Paganism, in its last phase, showed considerable signs of becoming equally changeless. This would not mean that new schools or sects of philosophy would not arise, as new schools did arise in antiquity and do arise in Asia. It does not mean that there would be no real mystics or visionaries, as there were mystics in antiquity and are mystics in Asia. It does not mean that there would be no social codes, as there were social codes in antiquity and are codes in Asia. It does not mean that there could not be good men or happy lives, for God has given all men a conscience, and conscience can give all men a kind of peace. But it does mean that the tone and proportion of all these things, and especially the proportion of good and evil things, would be in the unchanged West what they are in the changeless East. And nobody who looks at that changeless East honestly, and with a real sympathy, can believe that there is anything there remotely resembling the challenge and revolution of the faith. In short, if classic paganism had lingered until now, a number of things might well have lingered with it, and they would look very like what we call the religions of the East. There would still be Pythagoreans teaching reincarnation, as there are still Hindus teaching reincarnation. There would still be Stoics making a religion out of reason and virtue, as there are still Confucians making a religion out of reason and virtue. There would still be Neoplatonists studying transcendental truths, the meaning of which was mysterious to other people and disputed even amongst themselves. As the Buddhists still study, a transcendentalism mysterious to others and disputed among themselves. There would still be intelligent Apollonians apparently worshipping the sun god, but explaining that they were worshipping the divine principle just as there are still intelligent Parsees apparently worshipping the sun, but explaining that they are worshipping the deity. There would still be wild Dionysians dancing on the mountains, as there are still wild dervishes dancing in the desert. There would still be crowds of people attending the popular feasts of the gods, in pagan Europe, as in pagan Asia. There would still be crowds of gods, local and other, for them to worship. And there would still be a great many more people who worshipped them than people who believed in them. Finally, 
there would still be a very large number of people who did worship gods and did believe in gods, and who believed in gods and worshipped gods simply because they were demons. There would still be Levantines secretly sacrificing to Moloch, as there are still thugs secretly sacrificing to Kali. There would still be a great deal of magic, and a great deal of it would be black magic. There would still be a considerable admiration of Seneca, and a considerable imitation of Nero. Just as the exalted epigrams of Confucius could coexist with the tortures of China. And over all that tangled forest of traditions, growing wild or withering, would brood the broad silence of a singular and even nameless mood. But the nearest name of it is nothing. All these things, good and bad, would have an indescribable air of being too old to die. None of these things occupying Europe in the absence of Christendom would bear the least likeness to Christendom. Since the Pythagorean metempsychosis would still be there, we might call it the Pythagorean religion, as we talk about the Buddhist religion. As the noble maxims of Socrates would still be there, we might call it the Socratic religion, as we talk about the Confucian religion as the popular holiday was still marked by a mythological hymn to Adonis, we might call it the religion of Adonis, as we talk about the religion of Juggernaut. As literature would still be based on the Greek mythology, we might call that mythology a religion, as we call the Hindu mythology a religion. We might say that there were so many thousands or millions of people belonging to that religion in the sense of frequenting such temples, or merely living in a land full of such temples. But if we called the last tradition of Pythagoras, or the lingering legend of Adonis, by the name of a religion, then we must find some other name for the Church of Christ. If anybody says that philosophic maxims preserved through many ages, or mythological temples frequented by many people, are things of the same class and category as the Church, it is enough to answer quite simply that they are not. Nobody thinks they are the same when he sees them in the old civilization of Greece and Rome. Nobody would think they were the same if that civilization had lasted 2,000 years longer and existed at the present day. Nobody can in reason think they are the same in the parallel pagan civilization in the East as it is at the present day. None of these philosophies or mythologies are anything like a church. Certainly nothing like a church militant. And, as I have shown elsewhere, even if this rule were not already proved, the exception would prove the rule. The rule is that pre-Christian or pagan history does not produce a church militant, and the exception, or what some would call the exception, is that Islam is at least militant if it is not church, and that is precisely because Islam is the one religious rival that is not pre-Christian and therefore not, in that sense, pagan. Islam was a product of Christianity, even if it was a by-product, even if it was a bad product. It was a heresy or parody emulating, and therefore imitating, the Church. It is no more surprising that Mohammedanism had something of her fighting spirit than that Quakerism had something of her peaceful spirit. After Christianity, there are any number of such emulations or extensions. Before it, there are none. The Church militant is thus unique because it is an army marching to effect a universal deliverance. 
The bondage from which the world is thus to be delivered is something that is very well symbolized by the state of Asia as by the state of pagan Europe. I do not mean merely their moral or immoral state. The missionary, as a matter of fact, has much more to say for himself than the enlightened imagine, even when he says that the heathen are idolatrous and immoral. A touch or two of realistic experience about Eastern religion, even about Muslim religion, will reveal some startling insensibilities in ethics, such as the practical indifference to the line between passion and perversion. It is not prejudice, but practical experience which says that Asia is full of demons as well as gods. But the evil I mean is in the mind, and it is in the mind wherever the mind has worked for a long time alone. It is what happens when all dreaming and thinking have come to an end in an emptiness that is at once negation and necessity. It sounds like an anarchy, but it is also a slavery. It is what has been called already the wheel of Asia. All those recurrent arguments about cause and effect or things beginning and ending in the mind, which make it impossible for the soul really to strike out and go anywhere or do anything. And the point is that it is not necessarily peculiar to Asiatics. It would have been true in the end of Europeans if something had not happened. If the church militant had not been a thing marching, all men would have been marking time. If the church militant had not endured a discipline, all men would have endured a slavery. What that universal yet fighting faith brought into the world was hope. Perhaps the one thing common to mythology and philosophy was that both were really sad in the sense that they had not this hope even if they had touches of faith or charity. We may call Buddhism a faith, though to us it seems more like a doubt. We may call the Lord of Compassion a Lord of Charity, though it seems to us a very pessimist sort of pity. But those who insist most on the antiquity and size of such cults must agree that in all their ages, they have not covered all their areas with that sort of practical and pugnacious hope. In Christendom, hope has never been absent. Rather, it has been errant, extravagant, excessively fixed upon fugitive chances. Its perpetual revolution and reconstruction has at least been an evidence of people being in better spirits. Europe did very truly renew its youth like the eagles, just as the eagles of Rome rose again over the legions of Napoleon, or we have seen soaring but yesterday the silver eagle of Poland. But in the Polish case, even revolution always went with religion. Napoleon himself sought a reconciliation with religion. Religion could never be finally separated even from the most hostile of the hopes, simply because it was the real source of the hopefulness. And the cause of this is to be found simply in the religion itself. Those who quarrel about it seldom even consider it in itself. There is neither space nor place for such a full consideration here but a word may be said to explain a reconciliation that always recurs and still seems to require explanation. There will be no end to the weary debates about liberalizing theology until people face the fact that the only liberal part of it is really the dogmatic part. If dogma is incredible, it is because it is incredibly liberal. 
if it is irrational. It can only be in giving us more assurance of freedom than is justified by reason. The obvious example is that essential form of freedom which we call free will. It is absurd to say that a man shows his liberality in denying his liberty, but it is tenable that he has to affirm a transcendental doctrine in order to affirm his liberty. There is a sense in which we might reasonably say that if man has a primary power of choice, he has in that fact a supernatural power of creation, as if he could raise the dead or give birth to the unbegotten. Possibly in that case a man must be a miracle. And certainly in that case he must be a miracle in order to be a man, and most certainly in order to be a free man. But it is absurd to forbid him to be a free man and do it in the name of a more free religion. But it is true in twenty other matters. Anybody who believes at all in God must believe in the absolute supremacy of God. But in so far as that supremacy does allow of any degrees that can be called liberal or illiberal, it is self evident that the illiberal power is the deity of the rationalists, and the liberal power is the deity of the dogmatists. Exactly in proportion as you turn monotheism into monism, you turn it into despotism. It is precisely the unknown god of the scientist, with his impenetrable purpose and his inevitable and unalterable law, that reminds us of a Prussian autocrat making rigid plans in a remote tent and moving mankind like machinery. It is precisely the God of miracles and of answered prayers who reminds us of a liberal and popular prince receiving petitions, listening to parliaments, and considering the cases of a whole people. I am not now arguing the rationality of this conception in other respects. As a matter of fact, it is not, as some suppose, irrational. For there is nothing irrational in the wisest and most well-informed king acting differently according to the action of those he wishes to save. But I am here only noting the general nature of liberality, or of free or enlarged atmosphere of action, and in this respect it is certain that the king can only be what we call magnanimous if he is what some call capricious. It is the Catholic who has the feeling that his prayers do make a difference when offered for the living and the dead, who also has the feeling of living like a free citizen in something almost like a constitutional commonwealth. It is the monist who lives under a single iron law, who must have the feeling of living like a slave under a sultan. Indeed, I believe that the original use of the word suffragium, which we now use in politics for a vote, was that employed in theology about a prayer. The dead in purgatory were said to have the suffrages of the living, and in this sense, of a sort of right of petition to the supreme ruler, we may truly say that the whole of the communion of saints as well as the whole of the church militant, is founded on universal suffrage. But above all, it is true of the most tremendous issue, of that tragedy which has created the divine comedy of our creed. Nothing short of the extreme and strong and startling doctrine of the divinity of Christ will give that particular effect that can truly stir the popular sense like a trumpet. The idea of the king himself serving in the ranks 
like a common soldier. By making that figure merely human, we make that story much less human. We take away the point of the story which actually pierces humanity. The point of the story which was quite literally the point of a spear. It does not especially humanize the universe to say that good and wise men can die for their opinions any more than it would be any sort of uproariously popular news in an army that good soldiers may easily get killed. It is no news that King Leonidas is dead, any more than that Queen Anne is dead. And men did not wait for Christianity to be men, in the full sense of being heroes. But if we are describing, for the moment, the atmosphere of what is generous and popular and even picturesque. Any knowledge of human nature will tell us that no sufferings of the sons of men or even of the servants of God strike the same note as the notion of the master suffering instead of his servants. And this is given by the theological and emphatically not by the scientific deity. No mysterious monarch, hidden in his starry pavilion at the base of the cosmic campaign, is in the least like that celestial chivalry of the captain who carries his five wounds in the front of battle. What the denouncer of dogma really means is not that dogma is bad, but rather that dogma is too good to be true. That is, he means that dogma is too liberal to be likely. Dogma gives man too much freedom when it permits him to fall. Dogma gives even God too much freedom when it permits him to die. That is what the intelligent skeptics ought to say. And it is not in the least my intention to deny that there is something to be said for it. They mean that the universe is itself a universal prison, that existence itself is a limitation and a control, and it is not for nothing that they call causation a chain. In a word, they mean quite simply that they cannot believe these things, not in the least that they are unworthy of belief. We say, not lightly, but very literally, that the truth has made us free. They say that it makes us so free that it cannot be the truth. To them, it is like believing in fairyland to believe in such freedom as we enjoy. It is like believing in men with wings to entertain the fancy of men with wills. It is like accepting a fable about a squirrel in conversation with a mountain to believe in a man who is free to ask, or a god who is free to answer. This is a manly and a rational negation, for which I for one shall always show respect. But I decline to show any respect for those who first of all clip the bird and cage the squirrel. Rivet the chains and refuse the freedom. Close all the doors of the cosmic prison on us with a clang of eternal iron. Tell us that our emancipation is a dream and our dungeon a necessity. And then calmly turn round and tell us they have a freer thought and a more liberal theology. The moral of all this is an old one that religion is revelation. In other words, it is a vision, and a vision received by faith. But it is a vision of reality. The faith consists in a conviction of its reality. That, for example, is the difference between a vision and a daydream. And that is the difference between religion and mythology. That is the difference between faith and all that fancy work quite human and more or less healthy, which we considered under the head of mythology. There is something in the reasonable use of the very word vision that implies two things about it. 
First, that it comes very rarely. Possibly that it comes only once. And secondly, that it probably comes once and for all. A daydream may come every day. A daydream may be different every day. It is something more than the difference between telling ghost stories and meeting a ghost. But if it is not a mythology, neither is it a philosophy. It is not a philosophy because, being a vision, it is not a pattern, but a picture. It is not one of those simplifications which resolve everything into an abstract explanation, as that everything is recurrent, or everything is relative, or everything is inevitable, or everything is elusive. It is not a process, but a story. It has proportions, of the sort seen in a picture or a story. It has not the regular repetitions of a pattern or a process, but it replaces them by being convincing as a picture or a story is convincing. In other words, it is exactly, as the phrase goes, lifelike, for indeed it is life. An example of what is meant here might well be found in the treatment of the problem of evil. It is easy enough to make a plan of life of which the background is black, as the pessimists do, and then admit a speck or two of stardust, more or less accidental, or at least in the literal sense, insignificant. And it is easy enough to make another plan on white paper, as the Christian scientists do, and explain, or explain away somehow, such dots or smudges as may be difficult to deny. Lastly, it is easiest of all, perhaps, to say, as the dualists do, that life is like a chessboard in which the two are equal, and can as truly be said to consist of white squares on a black board, or of black squares on a white board. But every man feels in his heart that none of these three paper plans is like life, that none of these worlds is one in which he can live. Something tells him that the ultimate idea of a world is not bad, or even neutral. Staring at the sky, or the grass, or the truths of mathematics, or even a new laid egg, he has a vague feeling like the shadow of that saying of the great Christian philosopher, St. Thomas Aquinas. Quote, Every existence, as such, is good. On the other hand, Something else tells him that it is unmanly and debased and even diseased to minimize evil to a dot or even a blot. He realizes that optimism is morbid. It is, if possible, even more morbid than pessimism. These vague but healthy feelings, if he followed them out, would result in the idea that evil is in some way an exception but an enormous exception, and ultimately that evil is an invasion, or yet more truly, a rebellion. He does not think that everything is right, or that everything is wrong, or that everything is equally right and wrong, but he does think that right has a right to be right, and therefore a right to be there, and wrong has no right to be wrong, and therefore no right to be there. It is the prince of the world, but it is also a usurper. So he will apprehend vaguely what the vision will give to him vividly, no less than all that strange story of treason in heaven and the great desertion by which evil damaged and tried to destroy a cosmos that it could not create. It is a very strange story. And its proportions and its lines and colors are as arbitrary and absolute as the artistic composition of a picture. It is a vision which we do in fact symbolize in pictures by titanic limbs and passionate tints of plumage. All that abysmal vision of falling stars and the peacock panoplies of the night. But that strange story has one small advantage over the diagrams. It is like life. Another example might be found, not in the problem of evil, 
but in what is called the problem of progress. One of the ablest agnostics of the age once asked me whether I thought mankind grew better or grew worse or remained the same. He was confident that the alternative covered all possibilities. He did not see that it only covered patterns and not pictures, processes and not stories. I asked him whether he thought that Mr. Smith of Golders Green got better or worse or remained exactly the same between the age of 30 and 40. It then seemed to dawn on him that it would rather depend on Mr. Smith and how he chose to go on. It had never occurred to him that it might depend on how mankind chose to go on, and that its course was not a straight line, or an upward or downward curve, but a track, like that of a man across a valley, going where he liked and stopping where he chose, going into a church or falling drunk in a ditch. The life of man is a story. An adventure story, and in our vision the same is true even of the story of God. The Catholic faith is the reconciliation because it is the realization both of mythology and philosophy. It is a story, and in that sense, one of a hundred stories. Only, it is a true story. It is a philosophy, and in that sense, one of a hundred philosophies. Only, it is a philosophy that is like life. But above all, it is a reconciliation because it is something that can only be called the philosophy of stories. That normal narrative instinct, which produced all the fairy tales, is something that is neglected by all the philosophies, except one. The faith is the justification of that popular instinct, the finding of a philosophy for it, or the analysis of the philosophy in it. Exactly as a man in an adventure story has to pass various tests to save his life, so the man in this philosophy has to pass several tests and save his soul. In both, there is an idea of free will operating under conditions of design. In other words, there is an aim, and it is the business of a man to aim at it. We therefore watch to see whether he will hit it. Now this deep and democratic and dramatic instinct is derided and dismissed in all the other philosophies, for all the other philosophies avowedly end where they begin. And it is the definition of a story that it ends differently, that it begins in one place, and ends in another. From Buddha and his wheel, to Akhenaten and his disc, from Pythagoras with his abstraction of number, to Confucius with his religion of routine. There is not one of them that does not in some way sin against the soul of a story. There is none of them that really grasps this human notion of the tale, the test, the adventure the ordeal of the free man. Each of them starves the storytelling instinct, so to speak, and does something to spoil human life considered as a romance, either by fatalism, pessimist or optimist, and that destiny that is the death of adventure, or by indifference, and that detachment that is death of drama, or by a fundamental skepticism that dissolves the actors into atoms, or by a materialistic limitation blocking the vista of moral consequences, or a mechanical recurrence making even moral tests monotonous, or a bottomless relativity making even practical tests insecure. There is such a thing as a human story, and there is such a thing as the divine story which is also a human story. But there is no such thing as a Hegelian story, or a monist story, or a relativist story, or a determinist story. For every story, yes, even a penny dreadful or a cheap novelette, has something in it that belongs to our universe, and not theirs. Every short story does truly begin with creation 
and end with a last judgment. And that is the reason why the myths and the philosophers were at war until Christ came. That is why the Athenian democracy killed Socrates out of respect for the gods, and why every strolling sophist gave himself the airs of a Socrates whenever he could talk in a superior fashion of the gods, and why the heretic Pharaoh wrecked his huge idols and temples for an abstraction, and why the priests could return in triumph and trample his dynasty underfoot and why Buddhism had to divide itself from Brahmanism, and why in every age and country outside Christendom there has been a feud forever between the philosopher and the priest. It is easy enough to say that the philosopher is generally the more rational. It is easier still to forget that the priest is always the more popular. For the priest told the people stories and the philosopher did not understand the philosophy of stories. It came into the world with the story of Christ. And this is why it had to be a revelation or vision given from above. Anyone who will think of the theory of stories or pictures will easily see the point. The true story of the world must be told by somebody to somebody else. By the very nature of a story, it cannot be left to occur to anybody. A story has proportions, variations, surprises, particular dispositions, which cannot be worked out by rule in the abstract, like a sum. We could not deduce whether or no Achilles would give back the body of Hector from a Pythagorean theory of number or recurrence, and we could not infer for ourselves in what way the world would get back the body of Christ, merely from being told that all things go round and round upon the wheel of Buddha. A man might, perhaps, work out a proposition of Euclid without having heard of Euclid, but he would not work out the precise legend of Eurydice without having heard of Eurydice. At any rate, he would not be certain how the story would end and whether Orpheus was ultimately defeated. Still less could he guess the end of our story, or the legend of our Orpheus rising, not defeated from the dead. To sum up, the sanity of the world was restored, and the soul of man offered salvation by something which did indeed satisfy the two warring tendencies of the past, which had never been satisfied in full and most certainly never satisfied together. It met the mythological search for romance by being a story, and the philosophical search for truth by being a true story. That is why the ideal figure had to be a historical character, as nobody had ever felt Adonis or Pan to be a historical character. But that is also why the historical character had to be the ideal figure, and even fulfill many of the functions given to these other ideal figures. Why he was at once the sacrificed and the feast. Why he could be shown under the emblems of the growing vine or the rising sun. The more deeply we think of the matter, the more we shall conclude that, if there be indeed a God, his creation could hardly have reached any other culmination than this granting of a real romance to the world. Otherwise, the two sides of the human mind could never have touched at all, and the brain of man would have remained cloven and double, one lobe of it dreaming impossible dreams, and the other repeating invariable calculations the picture-makers would have remained forever painting the portrait of nobody. The sages would have remained forever adding up numerals that came to nothing. It was that abyss that nothing but an incarnation could cover, a divine embodiment of our dreams. And he stands above that chasm, whose name is more than priest and older even than Christendom. Pontifex Maximus, the mightiest maker of a bridge.
But even with that, we return to the more specially Christian symbol in the same tradition, the perfect pattern of the keys. This is a historical and not a theological outline, and it is not my duty here to defend in detail that theology, but merely to point out that it could not even be justified in design without being justified in detail, like a key. Beyond the broad suggestion of this chapter, I attempt no apologetic about why the creed should be accepted. But in answer to the historical query of why it was accepted and is accepted, I answer for millions of others in my reply. Because it fits the lock. Because it is like life. It is one among many stories. Only, it happens to be a true story. It is one among many philosophies. Only it happens to be the truth. We accept it, and the ground is solid under our feet, and the road is open before us. It does not imprison us in a dream of destiny or a consciousness of the universal delusion. It opens to us not only incredible heavens, but what seems to some an equally incredible earth, and makes it credible. This is the sort of truth that is hard to explain, because it is a fact. But it is a fact to which we can call witnesses. We are Christians and Catholics not because we worship a key, but because we have passed a door and felt the wind that is the trumpet of liberty blow over the land of the living. Tis the gift to be simple. Tis the gift to be free. Tis the gift to come down where we ought to be. And when we find ourselves in the place just right, t'will be in the valley of love and delight. When true simplicity is gained, to bow and to bend, we will not be ashamed. To turn, turn, will be our delight, till by turning, turning, we come round right.